If you have watched my show for just a couple of minutes or even 20 seconds, you know one thing about me that I love history. I think about it all the time. I talk about it all the time. I love old things. I love old relics. I love this old TV set. I love all the stuff that we have on the set. Anything that came before me that shows me what people have done, what they've built, what they tried and failed sometimes. It shows us that we've been blessed. I am honored to be the owner, or I shouldn't say the owner, the caretaker of many of these things. I mean, I know that makes me odd, but I don't think so. I think, I think Americans love their history. I mean, we're a young nation, but we love to learn about our past. If there's somebody that will teach it to us that's excited about it. And there's a good reason for it, really. I mean, our past is where we discover who we really are as a nation and, and what we inherited as children. We inherit certain things from our parents and our grandparents and our great-great-grandparents and our great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents. We inherited certain things from those who came before us. And it is critical that we know what those things are. Otherwise, we leave our inheritance on the table and it just washes away. And we don't even miss it because we don't even know what we lost. That's why I wish. That's why I wish that the person who sat at this desk, the people who come into this office who advise him, took the time and stopped thinking about the next news cycle, the next attack ad, the next election. But they would stop and they would take the time and walk over here to the bookshelf. And they would once in a while pull off a book and they would read it. The books aren't just for decoration, you know. Well, I mean, actually, these are his. It's a set, but the books aren't for decoration. They have, they have access to everything. For the first time in human history, you can read about anything. You can see it in their own handwriting. History tells us who we are, all in the pages of a book, what we built, what problems we faced, how we overcame them. The people who worked in this office just now and then, every once in a while, wouldn't it be nice if they read their own history? Because if they did, they would learn soon enough that some of the biggest problems that they face are small compared to the problems that people faced that came before them. Some of the solutions that they think will work have been tried, and they've failed over and over and over again. You know what they would learn? They'd learn that America has never been perfect, and America never will be perfect. There was no golden age of America. Except those times when we tried our best to be our best. Maybe they would learn that America has, has been better than this. And America can be better than this again. The problem we have right now is the people who sit behind this desk have so much going on around them. And most of them are so flawed in nature and in character that they confuse the seal with where they get their power. They confuse action with accomplishment. They don't spend time doing something that would, ser would solve a ton of their problems. They don't read. They don't study. They don't learn from the past. You know, history is the, the greatest weapon against one of mankind's strongest enemies, and it's this forgetfulness. Why do you write something down so you don't forget? Forgetfulness uh, is human nature. It's a human trait. I mean, I go to the supermarket and my wife, she can tell me, she can call me in the aisle. Hey, don't forget to get up a gallon of milk. And I'll be like, oh, you got it, honey. And I forget. I come home and I had forgot what happened to the milk. I didn't, uh, I didn't write it down. I get ready to leave the office. How many times does this happen to you? You forget where your car keys are. And you're like, I... How old are your parents? Let me think here. Uh, 
Forgetting how old your parents are, forgetting where you put your car keys, or forgetting to buy milk is one thing. Forgetting our nation's history, what this office means. Why do you think the president of the United States has a Remington? Because he likes cowboys or old statues? Why does he have that picture of the flags around the turn of the century? Why does he have the people here behind his desk, the pictures of his family, to remember where he came from and who he is? If the guy who sat at this desk loved history and would open up a book, he would find that this nation was attacked on our shores. They would find that the enemy worked to infiltrate our populations, that the enemy placed in our city sleeper agents, gathering intelligence, preparing for the day of attack. They watched, they listened, and they attacked. And then the nation took action. They tried to uncover the plots. They disrupted the plans. They found those who were guilty. They killed them. Because in America, we've always believed that treason or treachery Terror is a crime punishable by death. By the way, I wasn't talking about 9-11. I was talking about a time that has happened way in the past, over and over and over again. Can you name three incidences like September 11th? Everybody can do Pearl Harbor. Can you name one or two more? Find it, because they're there. Today, our nation faces a similar threat. The enemy has slipped by our thinly guarded borders, and we don't even know where they are. And when, when, when we discover these plotters, we don't even know what to do. We say, well, there's no precedent for this. We don't know what it really. So the people sitting at this desk, working in this office, they make things up as they go along. They bungle the prosecutions. They expose vital intelligence. They give comfort to the enemy. And they allow treachery and treason to build further. All because they don't know history. They didn't know that a prior administration 70 years earlier faced the same issue and developed a plan. And before that, it happened about a hundred years ago. Problems are easy to solve. If you look to the people who have solved those same problems before, the cost of historic illiteracy can be measured in the lives that have been lost to the terrorist attacks on our cities, the military bases, all because our leaders didn't study their own history. They didn't read. They pretended. Like, I'm the first guy to answer the phone. Hello, Oval Office. The first Americans to face a challenge. But they're not the first. They're not the second. They're not even the 50th. The circumstances change. The cast of characters change. The culture changes. But in the end, the challenge is exactly the same. And here it is. You're going to be prosperous or stagnant. You're going to be free or dependent. You're going to have justice or injustice, unity or disunity. Which is it, the individual or the state? These are the choices that every American has ever known, every president has ever faced. Every generation of Americans has been asked to choose which one. They're not new choices. Our problems aren't new problems. What's new is the self-imposed ignorance Ignorance of history, ignorance of what America stood for for 236 years, ignorance of what America has learned in those years, ignorance of the success, ignorance of the failures, that's new. You can get ignorant by not learning. But you can also be ignorant just by being arrogant. It'll always be like this. Government will solve the problem. Arrogance. Thinking you know more than those who came before you. By thinking that you know everything you need to know. That's what we see today. Wouldn't it be great if the president sat behind this desk? If he said, I'm going to try something completely different. 
I'm going to have you invite you as the American people into the Oval Office, and I'm going to talk to you once a week for 43 consecutive weeks. And every time, I'm going to talk about one president, one man, one president, one problem for five minutes. Just a little message about each former president saying each time, this president, Jefferson or Grant or Arthur or Truman, whatever. He led the nation for X number of years. This is the problem that he was trying to solve. These are the things that he tried to do. These is, this is where he succeeded. This is where he failed. And this, most importantly, the president would say, this is what I learned from his time in office. So I thank him and so must you for his service to the nation because we've learned something together. That's it. Five minutes. That's it. A simple acknowledgement that nobody, not even the president, is above history. No matter how you stand, you are not greater than those who came before you. Here's my hope. That if the current president or any president would just stop for a second, that maybe he would take the time and learn from history. If he would just stop and think about what history has taught him, he might realize that Americans are much better than he thinks, are stronger than he thinks, more independent, more industrious, more capable of great things. We'll figure it out together. We'll take care of each other. He doesn't need a magic wand. He doesn't need to give a speech. He doesn't need to sign a law. Americans are quite capable of solving problems. That's what we do best. Quite honestly, the president should sit at this desk and say, look, I know you are much better than your leaders. If he would just learn and recognize that Americans should and can be trusted, we'll make mistakes, but we'll correct them. Americans, if they're trusted and encouraged, Americans will restore this nation. They will rebuild it. They will use the original blueprints. They're around here someplace. They must be. Maybe, I don't know where they keep them. Maybe in the basement. Use the original documents. And maybe, just maybe, if we had a president sitting at this desk who appreciated that history would be his best advisor, he would begin to recognize that history is alive. It doesn't belong in the Smithsonian. It belongs to you. History is to be celebrated, honored. Let me close with one story, because this one story will tell you why history matters. This desk right here, it's called the Resolute Desk. You would know that if you were sitting in the office and you saw this plaque. But anybody who knows history knows that that plaque is no longer there. This plaque was changed, and it was reversed. This plaque tells the story of the desk, but this plaque now... Because Jimmy Carter had it changed, it now sits on this side where the president sits. They moved it. This plaque sat there since we got it. Is, see, this desk was a gift from the British. It came from a ship called the HMS Resolute. The Resolute was a ship in search of the explorer Sir John Franklin in 1852. And on that search, deep in the Arctic seas, the ship had to be abandoned by its crew. It was stuck in the ice. It was, it was a very valuable ship to the British. Well, three years later, an American whaler, George Henry, found it. He broke it free from the ice, and he towed it into an American port. Well, America had a choice. What are we going to do with this ship? So we decided to restore it, and we outfitted it, and we sailed her back to Great Britain and gave it to the British crown as a gift, a friendship. The ship spent three decades in service after that, and then she was finally retired. And when she was retired, Queen Victoria was the queen. She had an idea. She ordered that the best craftsmen would take that ship and use the wood from that ship to make two desks, one that the queen would keep in Buckingham Palace and one that would sit in the office of the best friend the United States. The president that got this gift was Rutherford B. Hayes. 
It's been in the White House for many, many years. It sat in the White House. It was used um, in the press room for uh, the fireside chats. But it was Jackie Kennedy that really actually thought this should be in the Oval Office. She brought it up into the Oval Office. She's the one that made it popular. You know it from the door in the front where John John um, came out. That's the famous picture of the Resolute Desk. And then after John F. Kennedy was killed, it sat in the Smithsonian until Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter decided to bring it back, and he changed a few things on it. And it's been there ever since. See, maybe it's easy to read history and think, well, that's just stuff and dead people. Uh, all the people are dead, Queen Victoria, whatever. But if you think of that one story and you're bored by it, well, then maybe I told it improperly. You can't be bored by history. If you're like me, you love stories like that because it tells you something. It tells you about a friendship and a national honor. It tells you in one story why America and Great Britain share a special friendship, a friendship both nations have fought and died to preserve. From that one story, you learn what it means to sustain a friendship over decades. That one story, that one story tells us oh so very much. It tells us why this bust of Winston Churchill should not have been boxed up. Because this was the next gift from our good friend, Great Britain. And this president boxed it up and sent it back. The same as if he would have boxed this desk up and sent it back. You see, this might have helped if, if this president knew and respected history. It might have helped when he was thinking, gee, what could I get the queen as a gift or the prime minister of England? In his first year of office, this president, maybe instead of an iPod and some DVDs of his greatest speech, I'm not kidding you, that's what he gave her, he might have been standing here at this desk and he might have looked at this desk and thought, we could do better. We should do better. And for once in his presidency, he might have lowered his head just a bit and looked down and seen history and avoided a mistake just by knowing history, just by acknowledging that he's not the first guy that ever came into this room and sat in this chair. That's how history is. That's why I love history. It's like an instruction manual for the world, an instruction manual for the president, an instruction manual on America. I mean, you can be president and read the, and not read the instruction manual. Sure, you can do that. But you know how it is with instruction manuals, whether it's a TV or a mobile phone or a country. I mean, if you don't read the manual, you're not going to know how the darn thing works. You won't get to use all of the, future, the features. It won't happen. And in the end... It's going to break, and you won't know how to fix it because you never read the manual. You don't even know where it is anymore. So even if our president won't study our history, you should. Because one day, you might be president. But I guarantee, even if you're not president, one day you're going to have to fix this mess. And it'd be good if all of us have read the manual first. Thank you so much for watching. May God bless you. And may God bless the Republic. From Dallas, Texas, good night, America.